Take your Bibles this morning, open to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, and look down at verse number 53. Mark chapter 14, verse 53. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word today? Verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priests, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Peter followed afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priests and all, and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it that which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ? the Son of the Blessed. And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Thank you. You may be seated. May God bless his word to our hearts today, his inspired infallible word. Would you pray with me today? Our Heavenly Father, we know that when we come to the word of God, it's not enough for us just to use our own, our own uh, intellect and logic and Uh, ways of learning. We need more than that. We need the illumination of the Holy Spirit. As the psalmist prayed, open thou mine eyes that I might behold wonderful things out of your word. And we pray that you'll do that for us today as we look into this passage of scripture. Open our eyes, open our heart, help us to see the beauty of Christ and apply it to our own life today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In uh, 1896, a Kansas newspaper man named Charles Sheldon wrote a book, and the book was based on an unusual premise. The premise was this, what would it be like if in every situation we asked this question, what would Jesus do? He described in the book a year in the life of an American city where everyone in the city, doctors and lawyers, merchants, salespeople, teachers, students, clergy, newspaper editors, made that question the basis for all of their decisions. What would Jesus do? Now, this book was titled In His Steps, and it became an instant bestseller in that day. And you probably have never heard of the book. I remember reading this book in high school. Uh, the, really, the book has largely been forgotten, but however, there was a fad that you may have been aware of that passed through with the Christian circles a few years ago, and some people still uh, take this very seriously, and that is uh, where people would wear these bracelets that had on it WWJD. You all remember that? What would Jesus do? And sometimes we see those letters on a bumper sticker, WWJD. What would Jesus do? And people would wear these bracelets to serve as a reminder that in whatever situation Uh, they were in, they were to ask themselves that question, what would Jesus do? And that came from this book written by Charles Sheldon, and that whole premise, the idea of what would Jesus do, came from, I believe, a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, where it says this in 1 Peter 2, 21, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, following the example of Christ. Now, where did Peter get that idea? Well, Peter, when he wrote this letter, 1 Peter, was writing to a group of believers that were going through severe persecution. It was unjust persecution. Uh, and Peter was reminding them of how to live in the, in the face of injustice, in the face of unjust suffering. And he said in verse 21, Jesus left us an example that we should follow in his steps. 
And so the word example here is an important word in chapter 2, 21 of 1 Peter. It's, an, it's a Greek word, hupo gramon. Hupo meaning above or over. Gramon is where we get the word grammar. And really it just means copying of letters, writing letters. And so you put the words together and it's writing above or writing over letters. And this is a Greek word that was used to describe little children when they were learning their ABCs. You know how they would do it? They would, they would write above the letters. They would write over them. So if there was an A on a piece of paper, they would copy above the letter A, and then they would write over the letter B and write over the letter C. They were basically tracing the letter, and that was the way that they learned their alphabets, their ABCs. And what Peter is really saying here is if you want to learn the ABCs of Christ's likeness then you need to look at the life of Jesus, and you need to trace his life. You know, people have these romantic notions of following in the footsteps of Jesus. But let me just say this. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy notion. In fact, it's very hard. And remember, when Peter wrote this, he was writing to Christians who were going through severe, unjust persecution by a corrupt government. When Peter wrote 1 Peter to the Christians in Rome, who was on the throne at that time? Well, it was a man by the name of Nero. And what had happened in Rome at that time was it was open season on Christians. Nero wanted to uh, remodel parts of the city. He wanted kind of he had an urban renewal program where he wanted to rebuild his own palace and things. And he was voted down by the Senate, so he sent out some of his henchmen to burn down that section of the city. And when the fire got out of hand and people died. And things turned bad against Nero. What did he do? He tried to find a scapegoat. There was someone he had to blame. And you know who who he blamed? He blamed the Christians. They were always talking about a baptism of fire. These were weird people. He thought they were cannibals because they talked about eating flesh and drinking blood. He misunderstood totally the Lord's Supper. And basically it was open season on Christians. And Christians were persecuted Some were killed. They had their things taken from them. They were going through unjust suffering. And Peter wrote this and said, look, if you want an example on how to suffer injustice, then look at the life of Christ. You want to know how to face that sort of thing in our world today? Then look at Jesus. In fact, you were called as believers to follow in his steps. That's the calling of every one of us here today. As we trace the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to trace him. The biggest letters of his life were the passage that I just read where Jesus suffered the last few hours of his life. He suffered massive injustice, massive uh, mistreatment. And Peter is saying, look at Christ and follow his example. Now, Peter would know because as we read in our passage, Peter was an eyewitness, right? He followed afar off. Now, he ultimately denied the Lord, but he was there. He saw the mistreatment of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he understood uh, how we are to follow in his steps. So let's look at the context here. What's going on here in Mark? Well, remember, this is early Friday morning of Passion Week. Remember, on Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and declared himself to be the Messiah. On Monday, uh, he cursed the fig tree, and then he cleansed the temple On Tuesday, he went back into Jerusalem from Bethany, and he taught. Remember, the religious leaders said, you know, what authority do you have to do these things, cleanse the temple? And Jesus gave three parables to answer that question. And then, with his disciples, he left the temple and went up to Mount Olives, and that's where he gave his Mount Olivet Discourse. On Wednesday, he warns the disciples that in two days he'll be crucified. On Thursday, he has the Last Supper in the upper room. He takes the Passover meal and transforms it into the Lord's Supper, the ordinance that we observe even to today. And it was there during the Passover meal that Jesus said, one of you are going to betray me. And they all said, is it I? Is it I? And you remember, Judas left the room and went out to put into effect the plan that uh, was made to betray the Lord Jesus. After the the, uh, Passover meal, Jesus and the disciples leave Jerusalem. They go to the Mount of Olives. They're on their way up to the Mount of Olives, and on their way up, Jesus stops at the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he prays the famous prayer where he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, the Bible says. He was in such agony that he sweat. 
drops of blood. The other disciples were asleep. You remember we saw that last time in Mark chapter 14. They couldn't stay awake to pray with Jesus. And finally, he says to them, sleep on, in verse number 41. The, the, now is the time. And while he spoke this, in verse 43, it says, Judas came with the multitude of soldiers, betrayed Jesus with a kiss, and they took Jesus away. And by this time now, it's early in the morning on Friday morning. This will be the day where Jesus is tried, and then he will be crucified. And what I want you to see is the whole trial of Jesus, because really it's a mockery. It shows how Jesus suffered unjustly. No one suffered injustice like Jesus did. Nobody. You know why? Because he's the only person that's ever been innocent. He's the only person who's ever been sinless of any crime. He suffered tremendous injustice. And I want you to see three events that demonstrate that. First of all, I call this the servant accused. They take Jesus after they arrest him to, to be tried. Look at verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. So where did they take him? They take him to the home or the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, what's going to happen in the span of 18 hours, Jesus is going to have two trials. There's going to be the Jewish trial before the Sanhedrin, and that'll kind of be in three phases. And then there'll be the Roman trial because the Jews did not have the power to put anyone to death. All they could do is bring that to Rome, show them the evidence and bring it to Rome. And Rome had to decide whether or not a person lived or they died. And so in the Roman trial, Jesus will stand before Pilate. But first we see the place of the trial. They take Jesus to the palace of the high priest. Uh, Matthew 26, 54 says this is the house of Caiaphas. In John 18, 13, it says, first they take him to the home of Annas, who was also of the uh, high priest, father-in-law of the high priest. Annas was the man who ran the money changer scheme in the, in the temple. So this guy had a lot of reason to be angry at Jesus. Jesus cost him a lot of money. He cleansed the temple twice. But by the way, the home of Annas and the home of Caiaphas was connected with a courtyard in between. And so really it was one big complex. They take him to Annas, and then they take him to Caiaphas. And in the home of Caiaphas, notice the participants in the trial. It says in verse number 53 that were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. This is really the Jewish or Israeli Supreme Court, we could say. Uh, these were, would be comprised 71 men, and this whole court of 71 men was presided over by the high priests. And so immediately after the arrest, they take Jesus to the home of Caiaphas, where are these 71 men, the Jewish high pri uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Jewish Supreme Court. And remember that this is just after midnight. This is 1.30 or so in the morning. So I want you to see the problems with this trial. Let me ask you a question. What if I told you you were going to be tried in the middle of the night at 1.30 a.m. in the morning? Not in a court of law, not in public, but in somebody's home. That the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is opening up his home for this special trial. And you're going to be tried. Talk about injustice. You see, the Sanhedrin was designed to save life. But here, they're going to take the life of Christ. That's why they're assembled together. They want to put him to death. And again, this trial was conducted early in the morning. The law specified that any trials were, be, were to be conducted during the day. There could be no secret trials. Every trial had to be in public, and that's for obvious reasons, so that no one could be framed, so there wouldn't be a miscarriage of justice. All fair courts today maintain that same procedure. We don't have court trials in early morning hours at 1.30 in the morning or 2 in the morning. They have to be during the day. It has to be done in public. There can be no secret trials. And another thing, the accused was always allowed to call witnesses in his defense. This is all part of Jewish law, but Jesus was not given that privilege to call in a single witness. In addition, there was to be a def uh, provided a defender for someone who was accused. If they couldn't provide for their own defender, 
then they would provide one for them. We still do that today, right? A public defender for someone who can't have their own lawyer. This was, this was part of what they did in this day. But Jesus was given no defender. He was absolutely alone. All his disciples had fled. Peter had just denied him. There, he was in the outskirts of the palace there, but he denied him. So Jesus had absolutely no one. And the Sanhedrin, they were to judge cases. They were not to prosecute cases. But here what we see in this passage is that the Sanhedrin is acting both as prosecutor and as judge. Look at verse 55, what it says. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Here's the high court that's supposed to be just an objective judge looking for witnesses to put Jesus to death. And verse 55 says they could find none. There were many willing to be false witnesses to, set, to testify against Jesus, but their testimony did not agree. It says in verse 56, for many bear false witness against him, but their witnesses agreed not together. So they had a problem. They couldn't find anyone whose witness agreed. Finally, they found two men who came forward and agreed in their testimony. Look in verse 57. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. And what they do here is they basically twist the words of Jesus. It was against the law to speak against the temple. And they took the words of Jesus as him speaking against the holy temple. And that's not at all what Jesus was doing. You remember what Jesus was talking about? He was talking about the temple of his body, not the, not the literal building. You destroy this temple, and in three days uh, I'll rise again. I'll build another made without hands, talking about his glorified body. And so they twist the words of Jesus. That's all they could find. And so here are these false witnesses. And by the way, if you were a false witness and it was found out that your witness was false, then the penalty was for them to bear whatever penalty the, the accused was going to bear. For example, it says in Deuteronomy, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the, the controversy is shall stand before the Lord. And behold, if the witnesses be a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to done unto his brother. So shall thou put away the evil among you. If I go and testify against someone that they committed murder and my witness is false, guess what? I die. I die because I wanted him to die. Here are all these false witnesses. You know what happens to them? According to the law, they should have died, been put to death. Nothing happened to them. And also, if the death penalty was being sought, the Sanhedrin was required to observe a three-day waiting period. Of course, that didn't happen here. Jesus was tried, he was convicted, and he was dead before 24 hours had passed. This was all a rush job. This was all a kangaroo court. And uh, it was also against the law to force a prisoner to testify against himself. You see, they had a problem here. Even though they had these witnesses, their testimony didn't agree. Look in verse 59. But neither so did their witness agree together. These two that came forward and said, oh, he, he said, you know, destroy this temple. But even then, there was questionable words in their witness, and it didn't agree. And so they still couldn't put Jesus to death. And so what does the high priest do? Look at verse 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? Which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Again, it's against the law to force a prisoner to testify against himself. But this is what they're trying to get Jesus to do because all their false witnesses fell through. And the Bible says Jesus remained silent. And in this he fulfilled prophecy, as a lamb before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was silent and all of that. Finally, the high priest calls upon Jesus 
using the most sacred Jewish oath. It really is more specific in Matthew, where the high priest said, uh, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And so this was an oath to God of truth. And because of that, Jesus finally speaks. Look what he says in verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. That was all they needed right there. And Caiaphas, right after this, he puts on a really big show. Because look down at verse 63. And then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? You see, according to Leviticus 24, 16, anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And so they attached that to Christ who said that he was God, but it wasn't a crime because Jesus was God. It wasn't a crime at all. But they had what they needed. If Jesus had just been silent, they probably wouldn't have been able to put him to death. But he knew why he was there. He was there to die for sins. And so he says, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of glory. Here Jesus is quoting from Daniel 7, a great messianic prophecy. This is an amazing claim to be God. There could be no, uh, no question after that, the claim that Jesus was making here. But even though it was against the law to use the, pr the, the prisoner's confession, they used his confession. And then Caiaphas, he rips his clothes. By the way, did you know that the high priest was forbidden to rip his clothes under the law? Forbidden to do that according to Leviticus 21.10. For a high priest to rent his garments was to disqualify himself from the office. You see what's happening here? The pretender is being disqualified before the true high priest, Jesus. He's the true high priest. The inferior was stepping down in the presence of the superior. And the funny thing is, Caiaphas was too stupid. He didn't see this. He didn't realize the significance of what he was doing. He was the last high priest of that old sacrificial system that was going to be abolished with the death of Christ just a few hours later. Jesus would be the real high priest, the one who would die and rise again, and ascend to heaven as our perfect, eternal high priest there making intercession for us at the right hand of God. So we see the servant accused, but then number two, the servant abused. What happens right after this? Look at verse 65. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and say to him, prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. So these men who were supposed to be men of the law, men of God, high priests, elders, scribes, leaders of the nation, the Supreme Court, they begin to spit on him. This is the worst kind of blasphemy. Jesus wasn't the one who was blaspheming. It was those Jewish elders that were blaspheming. Spitting in the face of God, that's inconceivable. This is the sign of contempt in Jewish culture. <clears throat> there in Israel, if you ever go over there, there's a place there in the Valley of Kidron as you're going up to the Mount of Olives called the, uh, the Tomb of Absalom. I've been there. Jewish people have long hated the memory of Absalom because he was the one who betrayed King David, his father. And to this day, anyone who is faithful to Jewish tradition, when they go by Absalom's tomb, they will spit on it as a sign of contempt. This was a symbol of disdain. And this is what they do to Jesus. And then they buffet him, it says in verse 65, which is the word that just means to punch, as if he were a punching bag. Others slapped him with the palms of their hands. And then they mocked him. They said, oh, if you're a prophet, prophesy. Tell us which one smote you. 
By the way, he will do that one day when they stand before him. The guards began to strike him, it says in verse 65. Even the temple police jump in and they take part. You talk about injustice and abuse. And then there's the third part of this. The servant accused, the servant abused, and then the servant arraigned. Now, they can't put Jesus to death, as I said before. They don't have the power to do that. There's one more step that needs to be completed before they put Jesus to death, and that is they have to get approval from Rome. The Jews didn't have the right of execution. They didn't have the... uh, the, the I.S. Gladi, as it's called, uh, the capital punishment ability or authority. And so in chapter 15, it describes the other trial. We saw the Jewish trial. Now here's the Roman trial. Look in chapter 15. Look down at verse 1. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. So this is probably... This occurred early in the morning, or probably around 5 o'clock a.m. now, right before the dawn. And they come together and they have one last meeting. This meeting probably didn't last any more than 10 minutes. What was the purpose of this meeting? Well, the, this was to legitimize an illegal decision that was made in the middle of the night. If they come to Rome and say, oh, yeah, we made this decision at 3 in the morning, that's a little fishy. So they decide to come back in the morning and say, yeah, we made this decision together unanimous here in the morning. And then they kept Jesus for a few hours, and then they bring him to Pilate's judgment hall. Look at verse 2. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said unto him, Thou sayest it. So according to Luke here, they bring him in and they accuse him of all kind of things. And as Pilate examines Jesus, he's not concerned about the religious charges that they bring against him. He was concerned about was Jesus a threat to the Roman rule? And so he asks this question, Are thou king of the Jews? And Jesus affirms it, thou sayest it. He affirms it to be true. And then look at verse 3, And the chief priests accuse him of many things, but he answered nothing. So get this in your mind. Now they're in Pilate's judgment hall. The religious leaders are there. They're accusing him of all kinds of things, and Jesus doesn't even answer. There was nothing more to be said. His silence was, again, submission to what was about to happen, submission to go to the cross. So look at verse 4. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. Are you silent? Are you listening to everything they're saying about you? Are you hearing all these accusations? And you're not going to say anything? And verse 5, but Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. He was amazed. Actually, the Greek word here means he was blown away. You know, he's probably used to having all these criminals in there pleading their innocence, arguing their case. But here with Jesus, he says nothing. And after his examination, John 18, 38 says, Pilate said, look, I find no fault in him. There's no reason to put this man to death. I find no fault. But look at verse 6. Now, at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. In other words, each year the governor would grant amnesty to one sentenced, a criminal that was sentenced. It could, could be whoever the people chose. This was a way to cultivate goodwill between Rome and the Jewish people. I'm going to let a prisoner free. It'll be the one that you choose. And so Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. He doesn't want to condemn an innocent man. So what he does is he goes back to the prison and he pulls out one of the most guilty criminals he could find, hoping that when he compared the two, the people would say, oh, yeah, release Jesus of Nazareth. Go ahead and condemn this guy instead. Who does he find? Look down at verse 7. And there was one named Barabbas. Interesting name. Bar means son of, Abba means father, son of the father. Some scholars believe his first name was Jesus also. Jesus, son of the father. Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And so here's Pilate. He's trying to get out of this sticky situation. 
He believes Jesus is innocent. He doesn't want to condemn an innocent man, but he wants to satisfy the multitudes that are there craving for someone to die. So he brings out Barabbas. And verse 8, and the multitude cried aloud and began to desire to him to do as he had ever done unto them. And verse 9, but Pilate answered them, saying, What shall I, uh, will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy, but the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. So Pilate wants them to choose Jesus to be released. That way he could punish someone who was worthy of punishment satisfy the bloodlust, supposed, of these Jews that were there. He was hoping that surely they would choose to release Jesus. I mean, wasn't he popular among the people? But it says in verse 11, the chief priests moved the people that they should rather release Barabbas unto them. They did their work. They persuaded the people to have Pilate release Barabbas. We want Jesus to die. And look down at verse number 13, and they cried out again, crucify him. Actually, back up to verse 12, and Pilate answered, and again, and said unto them, what will ye that I shall do unto him who ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out, crucify him. Verse 14, then Pilate said unto them, why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out more exceedingly, crucify him. There is this mob, and there, by the way, these are the same people that were saying Hosanna a few days before. A few days before, they were, son of David, save us now. But now here they are, and they're saying, crucify him. And they would not be denied. Now, you're in Pilate's shoes. What do you do? He knows Jesus is innocent, but he's under a lot of pressure, political pressure. He doesn't do, want to do any damage to his own reputation. And rather than doing what is right, Pilate reveals himself to be a corrupt governor. You know why? Because he does what's best for himself politically. He doesn't release Jesus. He perverted justice for the sake of political expediency. He went ahead and allowed an innocent man to be sentenced to death. You talk about corrupt. By the way, that, that sort of thing goes on today, as you know. All kind of corruption in government. But this is the ultimate miscarriage of justice. Again, no one has suffered injustice to the degree that Jesus did. Because again, he was the only person in human history that was sinless. He was absolutely suffered misjustice. Now, Peter, he sees all of this. And I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. We'll end it there. I want you to see Peter's commentary on this. Again, remember, Peter now is writing to believers who are suffering injustice. And notice what he says. Uh, we'll back up to verse t t uh, 17 of chapter 2. He's giving advice in the midst of all this injustice. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Make sure that even in the midst of this, you honor all men, love the brotherhood, you fear God, you honor the king, you give respect. Look down at verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God suffer or endure grief, suffering wrongfully. The word thankworthy here can be translated. This is a grace. This is intrinsically attractive and pleasing to God when a servant patiently endures harsh treatment to honor God's name, to please God. Look what he says in verse 19. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? In other words, if you suffer for what you've done and you do it patiently, there's no reward in that. There's no glory in that. If you're suffering because you committed a crime, because you did something wrong, and you're, you're taking it patiently, there's really no credit to you, to you in that. I remember years ago, I was out on visitation with a person. This, this guy wanted to come with me to visit, and we went out knocking on doors down in southwest Baltimore. After a few hours, we came back. We used his car, came back to his car. There was a police officer there writing him a ticket. 
And he went to the police officer. He said, what are you doing? The police officer said, is this your car? He said, yes. He said, well, you turn around, you're under arrest. The guy said, what? He said, you have many unpaid parking tickets and you skipped out on court hearings. You're under arrest. They called in a paddy wagon, put him in the paddy wagon. I remember as he was leaving, he stood up, looked out the window, the barred window at me, and he said, pray for me, preacher, I'm being persecuted for Jesus. I think he started singing a Christian hymn or something like that. I didn't have the heart to tell him that you're not suffering for Jesus. You're suffering because of your own foolishness. There's no merit in that. What does Peter say? What glory is it if if you suffer for that? But look at the end of verse 20. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, and you take it patiently, this is what? It's acceptable with God. This is what pleases God. And then look at verse 21. Here's the verse that started the whole fad. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow what? Follow in his steps. Follow in the steps of Christ. What would Jesus do? Well, in the face of injustice, we, we saw what he did. And look what he says in verse 22, just to emphasize it. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was suffering such injustice, he did not sin. He always acted in obedience to the Father. He never acted in self-will. There was never any guile in his mouth. He didn't bend the facts to win an argument or get his way. When he defended himself, he always just simply spoke the truth. Look at verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. He didn't trade insults. When they blasphemed him and spoke against him, he didn't insult him back. He didn't resort to threats. Look at verse 23. He threatened not. He didn't say, you just wait. Wait, I'll get even with you. He didn't respond to verbal abuse, and neither should we. You find out what you really believe when you get mistreated by others. Peter's point is this. This will happen to you too. This is going to happen to you. And, beloved, I don't mean to sound pessimistic, but I think before the time of the Lord comes, God's going to purge his church. And he may use a corrupt government to do it. We may have to face what the believers are facing here in uh, this context of 1 Peter, where the government takes away our freedom. We're to stand up and speak the truth of the word of God. You're going to have to pay a price. And God may allow us to go through that. What what do we do? Well, we follow in the footsteps of Christ. We do what he did. We are called to follow in his steps. You know, this is not natural, and this is very difficult. And I can can just hear what you're thinking, some of the thoughts and arguments against it. How How can we live this way? How can we be silent and be submissive and just seek to glorify God and and behave the way Jesus behaved in the face of such injustice? You know how Jesus did it? Look, look at the key is, I think, in verse 23. Notice what he says at the end. But committed himself to him that judges what? Righteously. This is, this is talking about God the Father. You know why Jesus could do this? Because he trusted his Father. He trusted in the sovereign will of his Father. And so, therefore, he could commit himself to God. He could take the abuse. He could be silent because he knew God had a sovereign will, and he was willing to trust God, to commit himself. The word commit is is a term that's used like you would commit money to a bank, or you would commit the guardians of or the life of your child to some guardian. 
You commit it to the Father. All of the things that I'm suffering, all the things that I'm going through, I'm going to do what's right before God. I'm going to seek to glorify God, and I'm going to commit this all to the one who judges righteously, knowing that one day he'll, he'll take care of it. We, we live in a day where we hear a lot about claiming your rights and all this sort of thing. But if we look at the life of our Savior, he did exactly the opposite. If anyone had rights, it was Jesus. And he had the ability to defend himself, but he didn't. Do you think Jesus was a helpless victim at Calvary? Of course he wasn't. He was the Son of God, and he had the power to call down legions of angels. But he never did that. He didn't say a word. And so in closing, let me just ask you a question. What if he had answered back? What if he had retaliated? What if he did insult Herod? He deserved to be insulted. What if he mocked Pilate? What if he used his divine powers to escape this injustice, these Roman soldiers? He could have fought back. What if he had? Well, if he had, we would not be saved today. We're going to heaven because Jesus didn't lose his temper. And what will happen if we copy that? Perhaps our powerful silence will convict others. Perhaps our kindness will disarm others. When we resist the urge to get even, when we stop claiming our rights, when we give up always trying to be <clears throat> understood, when we give up anger and bitterness, you know what happens? We become like Christ. And maybe that's when we begin to change the world. Let's bow for prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we are, again, so very grateful for the Word of God and how we see in it our, the life of our Savior. And Lord, as we look at this and we see the incredible mis injustice that Jesus had to endure and his submission, his willingness to be submitted to your will, to bear our sins, to be the Savior. Lord, we're again, we're in all of Christ. We're in all of who he is. And I pray, Lord, that you'll give us the grace to follow in his steps, to glorify you. We know that we live in a corrupt world, a world that is hostile to the gospel, hostile to the church, hostile to the word of God. It's very likely that before our Lord comes again, we will face injustice. May we follow in the footsteps of our Savior. May we emulate him in every way. And, Lord, we can't do this on our own. We need your help. So help us. Help us to have a forgiving spirit. Help us, Lord, to refuse to retaliate, but to commit things to your hands, to trust you in all these things. Give us that grace, Father. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to give a, one invitation before we leave. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, this would be the first place to start. A lot of times, the Bible will call us to do things that are just so against nature, like we just saw. And we can't do these things on our own. There's no way. We need the, the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And you can't get that unless first you come to know Jesus as your Savior. So I would ask you, do you know the Lord? Are you sh certain that you're saved? And if not, would you be willing to trust him today? Would you reach out in prayer and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I know that you went through all of that just for me to pay for my sin debt. Please save me, Lord Jesus. Make me your child. And if you pray that prayer, would you let us know? We want to help you. We want to encourage you along in your Christian life. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts, we pray in Jesus' name.